let me invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to uh, numerous texts that we're going to be looking at this morning, the Gospel of John, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And if you are with us for the first time, we have been in a series on being free. You know, a lot of individuals are saved by the grace of God, and maybe they've been saved for a long time, but when you look at their life and the overflow of what they, how they live their life, there's no freedom. There's no freedom on their face. They have a hard time smiling, and, and maybe they are in bondage to all sorts of things. You know, the fact that uh, Jesus Christ saves us and puts His Holy Spirit on the inside of us, sadly, sometimes, it, you know, individuals don't live the life that God wants them to. You know, you listen to people around you, and there's all sorts of people that are characterized by fear and worry and anxiety. And only God knows how many people are on certain type of medications because they say, I just can't handle life. I just can't deal with this life that, that you know, I'm living. And so take one medication after another, and then they get on another medication after another medication, and, and they medicate their life away. Listen, if you're here this morning and you know what it is to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, the God who loves you and created you and brought you into this world and the Christ who saves you, he wants you to understand what freedom is. But if I ask you this question, how would you answer it? How do you think the God of the universe looks at you? You know, a lot of people are, would say, well, you know, I, I know that I don't do a lot of things right, and I know I don't do this, and I don't do that. And uh, a lot of people are paralyzed when they think, I know God is always upset at me. Well, that's not the case at all. And uh, the whole purpose of this series, so that you and I can... Come to enjoy the wonderful freedom that God gives us in Christ Jesus. And I want you to listen uh, because we're going to be looking at different texts. But the first uh, text that we're going to look at is the Gospel of John. And then I'm going to look at 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians in just a moment. But I want you to listen to what Jesus is saying to those of his audience. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you what? Free. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed. And were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou? You shall be free. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whomsoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. And if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be, say the last two words with me, free indeed. Now, it's a given that Jesus Christ came that you and I could be set free. First of all, set free from the penalty of death and eternal doom and eternal damnation. Now, think about it for a moment. Aren't you glad just to think for a moment that someday you're going to have a wonderful brand new body. You're going to live in a timeless eternity. You're not, never going to have a negative moment for the rest of eternity once we're with the Lord. Amen? That is absolutely uh, almost beyond comprehension. But that's exactly what God says, and that's exactly what His Word says. But, uh, you know, so many Christians, though, they're not living in freedom, and uh, they're paralyzed. They're paralyzed in their life. They're paralyzed in their marriage. They're paralyzed in their home. Why? Because they're absolutely missing the life God purposed. Now, listen carefully. When Jesus Christ saved you, do you think He saved you to continue to walk and live in bondage? No. But so many people are. They are in the bondage of perfectionism. Some are in the bondage of unforgiveness. Some are in the bondage. And some people are in the bondage of, of ignoring. That is, they say, well, you know, I don't have anything that's, uh, that's controlling me. Some people are controlled by their jobs. Now, yes, we have to have jobs. We have to have income. We have to make ends meet. And, and we need to do everything we can. But some people are in bondage to their job. Some people are in bondage to recreation. You say, man, I'm not in bondage to recreation. No. Some people are out there and they say, you know what, every free minute I want to be doing something, form of recreation. I want to be hiking or I want to be doing this. In other words, really recreation has them in bondage. Do you realize what the bondage, what Jesus was referring to in this passage? He said, I want my children to know what it is to have freedom whereby absolutely nothing external controls you. You're not controlled by worry. You're not controlled by all the concerns that are in this world. Because stop and think about it for a moment. I want you to listen. And I want to ask you to repeat it after I say it. Have you ever stopped to think that your father runs the world? Amen? So I want you to say this. I want you to say it with me out loud. My heavenly father runs the world. Say it with me. My 
heavenly Father runs the world. I don't know about you, but that is liberating and that is free. But can I tell you that one of the realities, and we're going to look at two of these this morning, two realities what hinders us from freedom is simply because we don't see ourselves right. And that's what I want us to look at this morning because Jesus said in this text of Scripture, in verse 36, look at it. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. In other words, Jesus said, I want you to have a free earthly life. I want you to know what it is where nothing in life has you by, you know, in its grasp. In other words, nothing has you in bondage. Nothing has you in shackles. Fear don't have you in shackles. Worry don't have you in shackles. Money don't have you in shackles. Think about it. When Jesus Christ brought you into this world, he knew how long you was going to live, even though you don't know the day of your death. Do you think that he knows how much you need and how much money you need and how much you need to raise your children? Absolutely. So he's already given you a promise that, and so you don't need to be in shackles financially. But this morning, I want us to look at two aspects because the truth about it is there are two aspects of our life that if we don't understand them, then we can't live them out. Listen very carefully. You cannot live beyond what you don't know. In other words, if you don't see yourself in the right light, if you don't see yourself as God sees you, then you're going to live less than what, how God desires. And can I tell you, for a long time in my life, I didn't understand how God saw me. And I thought, I, I listened to what other people said. I lived sort of a distorted life. Let me give you an example before I get to these two points. Have you ever been in a hall of mirrors? Have you ever been someplace where they've got a hall of mirrors and you go to this mirror and, and your face is that long and your body's real short and you go to this other mirror and it's got you real skinny? I mean, you're real skinny and you stand there for three or four hours. You love that one. And then you go to this other mirror. You're not real skinny. You're real big. And watch this. You go to each one of those mirrors and they distort your image. They distort your body. They distort the way you look. Do you realize a lot of times the way we're living our life, we're living distorted? We don't think of ourselves right. We don't understand the truth of ourselves. And so we live based on what we think rather than what God says. Can I tell you that when you listen and hear how God views you, it will set you free. And it will be amazing how you see yourself. Well, I want you to look at number one. First of all, you and I need to understand how God sees us. We need to understand this one truth, and I pray you underline it because I want to give you some tremendous sobering realities in this. All those saved by the grace of God are, say it with me, saints. Now, I want you to look in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 because I want you to see what is taking place. Paul is writing to the saints of God at Corinth, and if there was a troubled audience that Paul had and troubled church, it was Corinth. There were women arguing with one another. And there was one man in the fellowship. He was having sexual relations with either his mother-in-law or stepmother or the situation. And, and Paul said, it's reported this is happening among you. And so uh, he's writing a letter to them and he's uh, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. But I want you to listen to it very carefully. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother. Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified, that means set apart, in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now, here's the picture. Paul is talking to the saints of God. He's talking to those that are saved. And there's something interesting you need to look in your copy of the Scripture and notice. Have you got your copy of the Scripture open? Are you looking at it? When you look at the phrase, call to be saints, do you notice that the two words to be are italicized? Do you know why they're italicized? They're italicized because they were not in the original text. That's simply there to give it flow. Whenever you see italicized words, that means that they're there to give flow flow to the text, and you see it different times in the King James. Now, what in the world is, is Paul doing? He said, I want to speak to you, and I want to tell you who you really are in the sight of God. I want you to grasp, I want you to grab hold of, I want you to get in your mind who and what God says about you and what you 
and how you understand what he says about you. So he says, I want to talk to you because you are called saints. Do you get that? Now, if you look at the word saint, the word saint is 96 times in the Old and New Testament. But listen, I want you to really tune in right here. Do you know how many times the phrase sinner saved by grace is in the Bible? Zero. Do you understand that when God looks at you, he don't see you as just a sinner saved by grace. You say, well, I mean, what's the difference? There's a lot of difference. Because you remember that song, we've sung it, and it's a wonderful song, has a wonderful message, but it simply says, I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Do you realize that God does not see you as only a sinner saved by grace? Let me show you. Let me give you an example. Let's say this, and I, and I, want, I need some audience participation. I want you to first of all say, I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Okay? I need audience participation. Let's say it. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Okay. Now, do this. Say with me, I am a saint of God. Say it with me. I am a saint of God. Can I ask you a question? Which one gives you more encouragement? Which one builds you up? Which one encourages your soul and your heart and your spirit? And so that's exactly what Paul was doing. Seeing the lives of so many, they've allowed themselves to be programmed by the world. And can I tell you, that's why so many people are not free. Well, I listen to what's on. Listen, if you listen very much... I mean, you've got social media, you've got Facebook, you've got Twitter, you've got Instagram, you've got Snapchat, you've got all those things out there. And people will tell you all about yourself. And the reality about it is, if I listen to all that stuff, if I listen to what people say about me, but I need to pick up what my Father in Heaven says about me. Do you get the picture? Here is Paul, the precious Apostle of God. He said, I want to talk to you saints. You see... Call your spouse a saint this week. See what that does. Saint Charlotte. Now, you don't know my wife if you're not been here, but she's sitting about four rows back. And she's smiling like I'm going to get you after church on this one. <laughs> but do you realize you're not just a sinner saved by grace? What we say about ourselves programs us. You see, a lot of times, well, I'll never amount to anything. I'll never be able to do this. That's not the case. We are saints who occasionally sin. You say, well, well, now, I don't know about that. Listen, if you're a child of God, you, you're not sinless, but you should want to sin less and less and less and less. Amen? Because we have the Holy Spirit of God living on the inside of our life. We have the Holy Spirit who guides our steps. We have the Holy Spirit who's going to direct us and lead us every single day of our life. And so, when you fail to know the truth, if you don't understand you're a saint, and you say, well, I'm just a sinner. You program yourself to sin. And now listen. Sometimes there's, we, we program ourselves. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm not very long in my spiritual life. Listen. You're programming failure. Whatever you read and believe about yourself, that's where you're going to go. That's why God wants you to be rich in the Word of God. Because the richer you are in the Word of God, the higher you think of yourself. I mean, the higher you walk. The, listen, we are children of God. We're adopted into the family of God. Why should we live low? Now, that's not being arrogant. Listen to the Apostle Paul. Listen to what he said. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, think about that for a moment. Either that is a bold proclamation of the power of God, or you've got one of the most egotistical apostles in the Bible. No, he's not being egotistical. He said, I know the risen Christ lives on the inside of me. I can handle anything that the world throws at me because I have the sinless Son of God living on the inside of me. And so, you know, when we refer to ourselves as sinners saved by grace, we program ourselves. And that's exactly what happens. Listen, if you're a Christian, you don't need to say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Now listen carefully. I know there's songs out there by that. I know that we've got a... Matter of fact, I was reading a commentary and, and this commentary that I was reading said, you know, we're sinners saved by grace and there's truth to that. We are sin, But, listen, you need to talk to yourself and you need to speak to yourself accurately and truthfully. And so, calling yourself a saint, 
motivate you? What does it motivate? Motivate you to holy living. Listen, you say, well, there's a lot of people around me that don't live a holy life. But think about it for a moment. When you stand in the presence of Jesus Christ, don't you want him to look at your life and think, man, you have walked holy in an ungodly world. The more ungodly this world gets, the more I appreciate Noah in his day and time. Amen? I mean, in the culture that was ungodly and Christless and godless in his day and time, here is Noah, that he found favor in the sight of God. And listen, don't you want to have prayers answered? And sometimes we program ourselves to sin, and then we wonder why God don't hear and answer our prayers. We sin, and we say, well, I'm just going to sin and confess that sin and sin and confess that sin. Listen, don't you realize that living and walking in habitual sin, first of all, you'll be a slave to sin. Second of all, you won't have answers to prayer. And so many people miss, well, why don't God hear and answer my prayer? He used to answer prayer. No, he still answers prayer. But listen, if you have a heart that you're not going to obey God, then you're going to miss out on his best. And so, you know, some think about, and and, uh, I want to give you just two or three. They're not on the overhead, but here's just a few references to the saints in Scripture. In Matthew 27. And the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Romans 1, 7. To all be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 15. But now I go into Jerusalem to minister to the saints. 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that the saints... Watch this. This is your job assignment. This is your job assignment if you're a child of God in the future. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you... Are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? And so all throughout the Bible, God says, I want you to see your saints. Listen to me carefully. You're not just sinners saved by grace. We are saints of the Most High God. We have a holy calling. We have a wonderful... Listen, you have a big assignment in the future. You're going to judge angels, first of all. You're going to judge the world, second of all. God's going to give you an assignment... I don't know how many angels are going to judge. Maybe 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. Maybe, I don't know how many angels there are. Only God does. But that's, and so we don't need to walk through this life wimpishly, belittling ourselves, degrading ourselves. Why? Our dad runs the world. Man, we ought to walk high. We ought to walk holy. We ought to walk desiring to please him. And you see, second of all, We're a new creation. Now, I want you to notice the underlying part. We are a new creation. You're not going to be a new creation. You say, well, if I'm a new creation, why do I still have aches and pains? You don't have your new body yet. I know where you're coming from. I heard someone say this the other day. He said, I found a secret. I said, whenever I stand up, I pretend I'm looking for something. That way I can stand there and get ready to move. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, you say. And, uh, you know, as you get a little bit older, things hurt. A little more so. And, uh, you know, things that uh, may have, and some of you think, well, man, I don't know what it is to have hurt. And I can say I'm grateful, Lord, I don't have many hurts. But, you know, there are some things that hurt, and you do, do notice a few little things. But listen, here's what Paul said to the saints. And I want you to listen to 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Now, in the, another translation, it says new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, you cannot live the way you lived before you were saved. Now, you say, now, wait just a minute. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Now, listen to me real carefully. I don't say that just to... Repeat it, but I want you to listen. When you were saved, the Holy Spirit of God came to take residence on the inside of your life. Amen? You absolutely cannot think and walk and do how you did before. Why? Because the Holy Spirit resides on the inside of you, and He is a wonderful presence to your conscience. In other words, that's why the more you are in church, the more you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit and your conscience put the brakes on things in life. You know what I'm talking about? You know, you think, nope, 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 that's not good for you. You don't need to go there. Why? It's going to hurt you. You know, you don't don't dabble in this. You don't do this. 
And you see, you say, well, I know a lot of Christians who, be careful when you say that. Because the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is true and authentic Christians. But the church has always had the true and the fake in it. I've said that in the last few weeks. Why? Because we need to understand that. So here's what Paul is saying to the saints. He said, I want you to understand. And I want, I want to read it out of the, another translation. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, the new things have come. Now, you didn't get a new body at salvation, but you did get a new way of thinking. You got, got a new way of living. You had a new desire system. Let me show you what you wanted to do, even though if you're genuinely saved, you wanted to read the Bible, even though you couldn't understand it. You follow me? And what Paul is saying to these saints, he said, I want you to understand, first of all, you are a saint and there's a newness about your life. You can handle anything by the power of God. I, that's not just an emotional uh, lesson. That is an absolute truth from the Word of God. I can handle anything. I can do anything. I can cope with negativism. I can cope with perfectionism. I can deal with unforgiveness by the power of Christ who strengthens me. I can through Christ. And so you don't need to let the world beat you half to death. And sadly, so many Christians say, well, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Listen, we program ourselves how we think. What are you programming yourself with? And the truth about it is, Paul said, I want you to understand and that I want you to be, look at Romans 12, 2 on the overhead. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul, what do you mean? Don't let the world tell you what to do. Don't let the world tell you what to do. And uh, you see, we've got in this, in this world, even as Christians, that, well, there's a lot of people that are more wealthy than I am, more famous than I am, more popular than I am. Like I heard one godly preacher say some time back, you'll find out who those that are real success are those that are in our heaven at the end of life and are, and are honored by the Lord Jesus Christ when they stand in His presence. Folks, that's success. If you stand in the presence of the Lord and you have a billion dollars and you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I don't want a billion dollars and miss Jesus Christ. Amen? I mean, miss a relationship. And so Paul said to these saints, don't be conformed. Don't let the world tell you how you live. That's exactly the word conform. Don't be shaped into the mold. And listen, can I say this to all of us? Because most everybody is on social media. Don't let social media dictate who you are. Don't let social media be the directive as to what you do, how you think. And, uh, you know, you see, I, I see something out there all the time. Said, uh, if you love the Lord, post this. And if you did post this and post this and post this. If you did that, you'd be posted all the time. We don't have time to post. We need to be busy doing the Word of God. We need to be busy living and walking righteous. And so Paul said, don't let the world conform you. Don't conform to the world. And so Paul said, live that life. And you know what happens? Now watch this. Do you think Paul had prayers answered? Oh, you better believe it. Do you think he had to holler to the Lord to get prayer? No. You walk in purity. You walk as a saint of God. You walk conform to the Lord or transform. You walk understanding you're a new creation. And you can call out to the Lord and you'll have prayers answered immediately. God will hear you and God will answer your prayers. And listen, when you're a dad in a home and you're praying for your family, you want God to answer your prayers. Amen? You want God to protect your wife and your children. And Peter even said in, in one of his letters, he said, Can I tell you why the prayers of some of you are hindered? You don't want to walk faithfully with your partner, with your wife. You don't want to walk faithfully with your husband. And so Paul is making it very clear. And being transformed, watch this. Transform means I let the Word of God get into my mind. Bill Gaither used to have a song out, still is out, uh, or maybe the Imperials, I can't remember, but are you getting into the Word? And this, here's the part of the song that's very, said, I'm not much concerned are you getting into the Word, but is the Word getting into you? You follow me? Yes, we need to get into the Word, but watch this. Here's Transformation. When the word gets into me as a dad. When the word gets into me as a man. When the word gets into me as a husband. When the word gets into me as just, a, just God's child. 
And so Paul said, transform. Let this mind, don't be so stuck on things that you're willing to change. I remember, I guess I was in my mid-twenties. God absolutely reprogrammed my thinking. I can't tell you how many things I thought were truths, we were half-truths, her whole lives. You see, a lot of people think, well, you know, I didn't have much of a good education. I was born in a bad spot, so I'll never achieve much in my life. I mean, after all, you know, you have to understand, Pastor, where I grew up. Well, can I tell you where I grew up? Byron's been through there. I think he and Heather went on a vacation there one time. I was raised on No Town Road. Boy, wouldn't you love your home town to have that name, No Town? Wouldn't you think they'd give it a better name than No Town? Well, it's N-O-E, but it's pronounced No Town. I was raised on No Town Road, Millsboro, Kentucky. And, I mean, here I'm living on No Town Road. I had some, I had some wonderful, wonderful influences in my life. Here was one fella. He was a thief. And uh, here was another, I'm he, serious, did time. Another fella, he shot and killed his brother. And it really had some good influences in my life. And do you realize, listen, God says, I'm not going to make you based on your past. I'm going to make you in spite of your past. And that's exactly what Paul You be conformed to this world and you're going to be in trouble. And he said, you be transformed. And the thing about it is, I want you to notice this. I want you to notice on the overhead. Satan knows. Look at the overhead. And I hope you understand. Because Satan knows that we live based on what's in our mind. He does everything in his power to keep us from absorbing and learning the word of God. Do you understand that? He don't want you to know that you're free. He don't want you to walk free. He don't want you to laugh. He don't want you to have joy. He wants you to believe that your past has got to hold you anchored. And I mean you've got to stay anchored to your past because of your past. It's sort of like I told you the illustration, but... It's worth using again. Like that little kitten. It was in a little kitty house or whatever. And, a little, and no doors to the side or no walls to the side, no wall in the back. It just had a little front. Had a little cage in the front and that little kitty thought it was still in bondage. He was just standing there. Didn't move to the right, moved to the left to get out of the cage. Didn't move to the back. He was just still right there, thought he was in bondage. Can I tell some of you, you think you're still in bondage when God freed you a long time ago. Some of you are living in bondage because you're just continuing repeating past cycles. You say, well, I can't get in the Word. Sure you can. Get up and get in the Word. You know, I can't forgive. Yes, you can choose to forgive. Because the Holy Spirit resides on the inside of you. He gives you the power to forgive anybody of anything they've ever done to you. Don't matter how many times. And the truth about it is, Satan don't want you to learn. Can I tell you, that's why in church, now please don't think I'm picking on you if this has happened to you. That's why Satan brings you, or that's why when you're in church, Satan puts you to sleep. Have you ever gone to sleep in church? Don't answer that out loud. Don't raise your hand. Because guess who's looking at everybody? Not me, the Lord. One of my family members, I won't impersonate him because sometimes he watches through YouTube and he lives in another city and he said, I, I liked your illustration about the family and uh, because he lives in, and uh, so everything that we have is on YouTube. And, and just as soon as we would go to church, he, he would rest his eyes. Never did go to sleep, he'd just rest his eyes. But now listen very carefully. Don't it make sense? If Satan can put you to sleep for 30 minutes, you've lost all the Word of God. Oh, he is so good at his craft. Have you ever gone to sleep praying? I have. Been praying, gone right to sleep. And, and I thought, Lord, what? Because Satan loves. Well, look at this. Satan knows that we live based on what's in our mind. That's why he don't want you to get in the Word of God. He don't want you to know you're free. He don't want you to call yourself a saint. Listen, you should practice this week, husband and wife. Call each other saints. You might have to take your kids to the hospital. Dad, you're calling mom a saint? Mom, you're calling dad a saint? That's who our Father calls us. Why? Listen, 
If our God in heaven, our Father calls us saints, what right do we have simply to say we're just sinners saved by grace? Can you answer that for me? We don't have a right just to call ourselves sinners saved by grace when he calls us a saint. And that's, that's simply the, the truth of the word of God. And so, you know, he don't want us to live based on the past. And that's what Paul said, transform. And by the way, it takes an entire lifetime to transform. Because guess what? If you had negative influences in your life, they just didn't happen in one day's time, did they? I can recall different people who've come into my office and they said, and I'll never forget this. I can't even remember who he was now. But he was 41 years old. I remember that because he told me his age. And he came in and he had a bad relationship with his dad. And listen to what he said. And I still remember it. He said, I went over to hug my dad when I was 11 years old. And he put his hand up. He said, son, we don't do that anymore. He heard rejection. You don't put your hands around me anymore. And what his dad was saying was not what he heard. But he heard rejection. And here was a 41-year-old man sitting across from my desk and crying his heart out because my dad has rejected me. Now listen, you may have had an earthly dad that rejected you. You may have had an earthly mom that rejected you. You may have had somebody that raised you, rejected you. They finally said, get out of here. But you will never have a heavenly father who rejects you one iota. He has wonderful plans for your life. And we need to allow ourselves to believe the word of God, what God says about us in spite of what's happened. And that's exactly what God does in his children. He absolutely programs everything. Here is the apostle Paul. He was out killing. He was out hurting people who were a part of the way. That's what they were called in early New Testament times. They weren't called the church, but they, people were trying to figure out who they were. They were just part of the way. And God moved in Paul's life and Paul said, this one thing I do, forget it. What do you do, Paul? I forget. Why? Because of the wonderful, overflowing grace of God in my life. I'm not who I used to be. I'm not going to walk like I used to walk. I'm not going to live like I used to live because I am a saint. Now listen, here's what you need to understand about the phrase saint and a new creation. Those are not emotional terms. Those are divine, legal, eternal terms that God uses. You are and you will forever be a saint of God. I don't know but what that might be our title that we're used in the new kingdom. Saint Mike. Saint Kim. Because you notice how frequently Paul said to the saints. That might be how we're referred to along with our name. St. Don, St. Kitty. You say, well, I just don't think of myself that way. You know why? Because the devil's changed the price tags on us. This story pretty much sums it up in closing. Two young men decided they'd have a good time at a store. They broke into the store. And they were just going to have a little fun. They didn't steal a single solitary thing. They didn't ransack anything. But here's what they did on about everything that they had time to while they were in the store. They changed the price tags. It was a high-end store. In other words, a meat coat was like $9.99. A pair of shoes was $10,000 or $1,000. They changed. I mean, it was a high-end store. And the clerk would ring up the item, whatever it was, and they'll go by the price tag. And they just changed the price tags. Now, here's the point. The devil loves to change the price tag in our life. He wants us to believe that we're somebody we're not and we're, we are somebody that God not, didn't make us to be. And, and he tries to confuse. In other words, you're worthless, he says. You'll never amount to anything, he says. You can't overcome this, he says. But would you let the Lord... Iterate into your soul and your spirit. Paul said, you know what? I'm not going to listen to the devil. I'm not going to give place to the devil. I'm going to trust the wonderful, transforming power of God. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
I can overcome any past. I can overcome any issue. I can overcome negativism. I can overcome, I can do anything through Christ. Because when I live the way God wants me to live, all hell is scared to death. You realize that? When we live as children of God, all hell is scared of us. You say, how do you know that? Do you remember the spirits that Paul said, told, I know Paul and the others I know, but I don't know you all in the book of Acts? Do you realize when you allow yourself to be transformed, you allow yourself to be governed by God, you allow, you grow The Father is pleased, the Holy Spirit is pleased, the Son is pleased, and you scared the devil to death. Why? Because there's a man of God, there's a woman of God, there's a boy or a girl that's wanting to be what I want them to be. See, Satan loves to petrify us. He loves to scare us. He loves to do everything that he can to do us in. God don't want us to be scared. He said, I want you to know the truth. And when you know the truth, the truth sets you free. I've used this before and I'm going to use it in the closing. You say, well, I'm scared of the devil. Well, we don't need to toy with the devil. We don't need to test the devil. We don't need to, but we need to understand the truth. And the truth is, the Holy Spirit resides on the inside of us. And after all, if the devil was so, so power, power, uh, powerful, powerful, If he could do with us whatever he wanted, let me show you. Let me use a little example. If the devil could kill us, if the devil could kill us, do what he wanted to, why don't he kill me right now, right where I stand? You say, Pastor, I wouldn't say that. Can I tell you two things I've learned in my walk with the Lord? The devil loves to scare us to death. You know what I mean? And a good example of that is you go to the movies. You ever been to the movies and you got scared half to death and you couldn't even go home? And I remember a movie from my childhood days. It still rests with me. It's called The Satan Bug. You might have seen that years ago. Oh, it scared me to death. And I was just about nine or ten years old. And I told my oldest sister, I said, I'm not sleeping by myself. I was afraid of that bug. But these big old monsters that are projected onto a screen out there, you go back and you look and they're about like that big. The things that are bothering your soul, the devil projects them in your heart and they're about that big. You say, Father, get this out of my life. I want to walk on. I want to be what you purpose me to be. That's why Paul said, I can do anything through Christ. Let Satan try to stop me and I'll use the power of God upon him. You see, when you understand who you are, it's amazing what God does. This one last illustration and I close. Some years ago when I was in seminary in Louisville, Southern Seminary, one of the ladies was one of the classes. Her husband was running for state attorney general for the state of Illinois. And she shared a story that I've never forgotten. Hope I never to my dying day. She said, you know, I was leaving them all one day. And she said, I was going to my car and there was about three or four men that was following me. And she said, I knew they didn't mean me good. And she said, I went to my car and here they came on me. And she said, I I knew they was going to try to hurt me and harm me. She said, I got to my car and I just turned around. And she said, I want to tell every one of you, you all can't touch me because I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb of God. That scared them half to death and they ran away. We're covered by the blood of the Lamb of God. We're children of the Most High God. We're saints of God. We have an assignment in the present and an assignment in the future. And we're new creations. Let's live the life that God intended us as free men and women of God.